Socialism, Utopian and Scientific by Friedrich Engels The materialist conception of history starts from the position, proposition that the production of the means to support human life and, next to the production, the exchange of things produced is the basis of all social structure, that in every society that has appeared in history, the manner in which wealth is distributed and society divided into classes or orders is dependent upon what is produced, and how it is produced, and how the products are exchanged. From this point of view, the final causes of all social changes and political revolutions are to be sought. Not in men's brains, not in men's better insights into eternal truth and justice, but in changes in the modes of production and exchange. They are to be sought, not in philosophy, but in the economics of each particular epoch. The growing perception that existing social institutions are unreasonable and unjust, that reason has become unreason, and right wrong, is only proof that in the modes of production and exchange changes have silently taken place with which the social order, adapted to earlier economic conditions, is no longer in keeping. From this, it also follows that the means of getting rid of the incongruities that have been brought to light must also be present in a more or less developed condition within the changed modes of production themselves. These means are not to be invented by deduction from fundamental principles, but are to be discovered in the stubborn facts of the existing system of production. What is then the position of modern socialism in this connection? The present situation of society that is now pretty generally conceded is the creation of the ruling class of the day, of the bourgeoisie. The mode of production peculiar to the bourgeoisie known since Marx, as the capitalist mode of production, was incompatible with the feudal system, with the privileges it conferred upon individuals, entire social ranks and local corporations, as well as with the hereditary ties of subordination, which constituted the framework of its social organization. The bourgeoisie broke up the feudal system and built upon its ruins the capitalist owner of society, the kingdom of free competition, of personal liberty, of the equality, before the law, of all commodity owners, and of all the rest of the capitalist blessings. Thenceforward, the capitalist mode of the production could develop in freedom, since steam, machinery, and the making of machines by machinery transform the the manufacture into modern industry. The productive forces evolved under the guidance of the bourgeoisie, developed with rapidity and in a degree unheard of before. But just as the older manufacturer in its time and handicraft became more developed under its influence, had come into collision with the feudal trammels of the guilds. So now modern industry, in its complete development, comes into collision with the bounds within which the capitalist mode of production holds it confined. This new productive, productive force have already outgrown the capitalist mode of using them. And this conflict between productive forces and the modes of production is not a conflict engendered in the mind of men. Like that between original sin and divine justice. It exists, in fact, objectively outside us, 
independently of the will and actions, even of the men that have brought it on. Modern socialism is nothing but a reflex in thought of this conflict. In fact, its ideal reflection in the minds first of the class directly suffering under it, the working class. Now, in what does this conflict consist? Before capitalist production, it is in the Middle Ages. The system of petty industry obtained generally based upon the private property of the laborers in, the na in, their, in their means of production. In the country, the agriculture of the small peasant, freeman, or serf. In the towns, the handicrafts organized in guilds, the instruments of labor, land, agricultural implements, the workshop, the tool were the instruments of labor of single individuals, adapted for the use of one worker, and therefore of necessity, small dwarfish circumscribed. But for this very reason, they belonged as a rule to the producer himself, to concentrate these scattered, limited means of production, to enlarge them, to, true, to turn them into the powerful levers of production of the present day, this was precisely the historic role of capitalist production and of its upholder, the bourgeoisie. In the fourth section of Capital, Marx has explained in detail how since the 15th century this has been historically worked out through the three phases of simple cooperation, manufacture, and modern industry. But the bourgeoisie, as is shown there, could not transform these puny means of production into mighty, mighty productive forces without transforming them, at the same time, from means of production of the individual into social means of production only workable by a collectivity of men. The spinning wheel, the hand loom, the blacksmith's hammer were replaced by the spinning machine, the power loom, the steam hammer. The individual workshop, by the factory implying the cooperation of hundreds and thousands of workmen. In like manner, production itself changed from a series of individual into a series of social acts, and the production from individual to social parts. The yarn, the cloth, the metal articles that now come out of the factory were the joint product of many workers. Though through whose hands they had successively to pass before they were ready. No one person could say of them, I made that, that, this is my product. But where in a given society, the fundamental form of production is that spontaneous division of labor which creeps in gradually and not Upon any preconceived plan, there the products take on the form of commodities, whose mutual exchange, buying and selling enable the individual producers to satisfy their manifold wants. And this was the case in the Middle Ages. The peasant, example gratia, sold to the artisan agricultural products, and brought from him the products of handicraft. And to this society of individual producers, of commodity producers, the new mode of production thrusts itself. In the midst of the old division of labor, grown upon spontaneously upon no definite plan, which had governed the whole of society, now arose the division of labor upon a definite plan. As organized in the factory, side by side with the individual production, appeared social production. The products of both were sold in the same market, and therefore at the prices at least approximately equal. But organization upon a definite plan was stronger than spontaneous division of labor. The factories working with the combined social forces of collective collectivity of individuals produced their commodities far more cheaply than the individual small producers. Individual producers succumbed in one department after another 
socialized production revolutionized all the other methods of production. But its revolutionary character was, at the same time, so little recognized that it was, on the contrary, introduced as a means of increasing and developing the production of commodities. When it arose, it finally found ready made and made liberal use of certain machinery for the production and exchange of commodities. Merchants, capital, handicraft, wage, labor, socialized production, thus introducing itself as a new form of the production of commodities. It was a matter, of course, that under it, the old forms of appropriation remained in full swing and were applied to its products as well. <coughs> in the medieval stage of evolution of production of commodities, the question as to, as to the owner of the product of labor could not arise. The individual producer, as a rule, had from raw material belonging to himself and generally his own handiwork, produced it with his own tools, by the labor of his own hands or of his family. There was no need for him to appropriate the new product. It belonged wholly to him, as a matter of course. His property in the product was, therefore, based upon his own labor. Even where external help was used, this was, as a rule, of little importance, and very generally was compensated by something other than wages. The apprentices and journeymen of the guilds worked less for board and wages than for education. In order that they might become master craftsmen themselves. Then came the concentration on the means of production and of the producers in large workshops and manufactories. Their transformation into actual socialized means of production and socialized producers. And the socialized producers and the means of production and their products were still treated. After this change, just as they have been before, it is as the means of production and the products of individuals. Hitherto, the owner of the instruments of labor had himself appropriated the new product. Because, as a rule, it was his own product and the assistance of others was the exception. Now the owner of the instruments of labor always appropriated to himself the product, although it was no longer his product, but exclusively the product of the labor of others. Thus, the products now produced socially were not appropriated by those who had actually set in motion a means of production and actually produced the commodities, but by the capitalists. The means of production themselves and production itself have become, in essence, socialized. But they were subjected to a form of appropriation which presupposes the private production of individuals, under which, therefore, everyone owns his own product and brings it to market. The mode of production is subjected to this form of appropriation, although it abolishes the conditions upon which the latter rests. This contradiction which gives to the new mode of production its capitalistic character contains the germ of the whole of the social antagonisms of today. The greater the mastery obtained by the new mode of production over all imported fields of production and in all manufacturing countries, the more it reduced individual production to an insignificant residuum the more clearly was brought out the incompatibility of socialized production with capitalistic appropriation. The first capitalist found, as we have said, alongside of other forms of labor, wage labor ready made for them on the market. But it was an exceptional complementary accessory transitory wage labor. The agricultural laborer Though, upon occasion, he hired himself out by the day, 
had a few acres of his own land on which he could at all events live in a pinch. The guilds were so organized that the journeymen of today became the master of tomorrow. But all this was changed. As soon as the means of production became socialized and concentrated in the hands of capitalists, the means of production, as well as the product of the individual producer, became more and more worthless. There was nothing left for him but to turn to wage worker, under the capitalist. Wage labor of a for time, the exception and accessory, now became the rule and basis of all production. A for time complementary. And now became the sole remaining function of the worker. The wage worker for a time became a wage worker for life. The number of these permanent was further enormously increased by the breaking up of the feudal system that occurred at the same time by the disbanding of the retainers of the feudal lords, the eviction of the peasants from their homesteads, etc. The separation was made complete by the means of production concentrated in the hands of the capitalists on the one side and the producers possessing nothing but their labor power on the other side. The contradiction between socialized production and capitalistic appropriation manifested itself as the antagonism of the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. We have seen the capitalistic mode of production thrust its way into a society of commodity producers, of, com of individual producers, whose social bond was the exchange of their products. But every society based upon the production of commodities has this peculiarity, that the producers have lost control over their own social interrelations. Each man produces for himself with such means of production as he may happen to have and for such exchange as he may require to satisfy his remaining wants. No one knows how much of this peculiar article is coming on the market, nor how much of it will be wanted. No one knows whether his individual product will meet an actual demand, whether he will be able to make good his costs of production, or to even sell as commodity at all. Anarchy reigns in socialized production. But the production of commodities, like every other form of production, has its peculiar inherent laws inseparable from it. And these laws work despite anarchy and through anarchy. They reveal themselves in the, own, in the only persistent form of social interrelations. It asked in exchange. And here they have the effect. Here they affect the individual producers as compulsory laws of competition. They are, at first, unknown to these producers themselves and have to be discovered by them gradually and as a result of experience. They work themselves out therefore independently of the producers, and in antagonism to them as inexorable natural laws of their peculiar, particular form of production, the product governs the producers. In medieval society, especially in the earlier ex centuries, production was essentially directed toward satisfying the wants of the individual. Is satisfied in the man only the wants of the producer and his family. Where relations of personal dependence existed, as in the contrary, it also helped to satisfy the wants of the feudal lord. And all thus there was therefore no exchange. The products, consequently, did not assume the character of commodities. The family of the peasant produced almost exactly everything they wanted, cloth, clothes and furniture, as well as the means of subsistence. Only when it began to produce more than what was sufficient to supply its own need 
wants and wants the payments and kind to the feudal lords. Only then did it also produce commodities. This surplus was then was then thrown into socialized exchange and offered for sale. Became commodities. The artisans in the towns, it is true, had from the first to produce for exchange, but they also themselves supplied the greatest part of their individual wants. They had gardens and plots of land. They turned their cattle out into a into the communal forest, which also yielded, yielded them timber and firing, and women spun fuck, flax, wool, and so forth. Production for the purpose of exchange, production of commodities, was only in its infancy. Hence, exchange was restricted, the market narrow, and methods of production stable. There was local exclusiveness of a local unity within. The mark in the country, in the town, the guild. But with the extension of the production of commodities, and especially with the introduction of the capitalist mode of production, the laws of commodity production, hitherto latent, came into action more openly and with greater force. The old bonds were loosened. The old exclusive limits broken through. The producers were more and more turned into independent, isolated producers of commodities. It became apparent that the production of society at large was ruled by absence of plan, by accident, by anarchy. And this anarchy grew to greater and greater height, but a chief means by aid of which the capitalist mode of production intensified this anarchy of socialized production was the exact opposite of anarchy. It was the increasing organization of production upon a social basis in which individual productive establishment in every individual productive establishment. By this, the old, peaceful, stable condition of things were ended. Wherever this organization of production was introduced into a branch of industry, it brooked no other method of production by its side. The, fa the field of labor became an integrated battleground. Battleground. The great geographical discoveries and the colonization following them multiplied markets and quickened the transformation of handicraft into manufacture. The war did not simply break out between the individual producers of particular, particular localities, the local struggles beat in them, national conflicts, and the national conflicts the commercial wars of the 17th and 18th century.